All right. Hello, guys. That was the intro. I'm going to explain what big data serving is, um, the challenges and advantages of using it, and then dive into a platform that solves those problems that you can all use yourself. But let's start with uh, my big claim, which is this. Big data serving will take over all of applied AI in the Hopefully, I'll be able to convince you of this um, as part of this talk. But uh, let us start by understanding what big data serving is. And to do that, I'd like to start by going through the four maturity levels that organizations go through as they start using big data. First, the data is just latent. Uh, the organization produces big data, but they're not systematically using it for anything. Uh, for example, if you have a video streaming site, something like Netflix, and they are at this stage, they produce logs uh, showing which people are viewing what content, but they are not systematically using the data for anything. Then you get to the analysis stage, where um, you start using uh, uh, data analysis tools to inform users that will make decisions based on your data, right? Uh, so in, your, in the video example, it would be paying people to, um, to create graphs and views over your data to show to humans that will then create curated lists of movie recommendations, for example, uh, to the users of the site. Then you get to the learning stage, where you try to cut the user, uh, the employees out of the loop and automatically use the data to learn uh, what to do, right? So in the video example, that would be using your data to automatically learn list of movies or series that you should recommend to each of your segments of users, right? And here you get to technologies like Spark and Hadoop and so on. Finally, you get to the acting stage where you're not just using your data offline to learn something, but you're using your data online to make decisions in real time as you need some decision made. In the movie streaming example, that would be rather than computing list of movies that you want to recommend to users uh, upfront, you compute a list for each specific user in their specific content using up-to-date information as they visit your site. So that's big data serving. Uh, there's a similar, simpler problem where you make decisions in real time, which is uh, often called stream processing, sometimes model serving, where you make decisions using only a single data item. That's a simpler problem, uh, but here, in big data serving, you need to look at lots of data to make decisions. So with that, we can define what big data serving is. It is the selection, organization, and inference or, big or machine learning models over uh, big data sets that are constantly changing because you need you want to take into account the real-time uh, up-to-date information. And you do all of this computation of your data with low latency, typically a latency budget less than 100 milliseconds because there are there's some typically some end user waiting for your decision and humans typically get subconsciously annoyed if uh, the responses take more than about 400 milliseconds and you need to set aside time for network and front ends and so on, which leads to latency budget typically at about 100 milliseconds. So condensing this to a very short sentence, big data serving is AI plus big data plus online. So with that, the advantages of doing this, um, the advantages of applying AI, I assume are obvious, but the advantages of using big data are not that obvious. So to explain that, in some use cases, it's you have to use big data to make it work at all, right? And 
the most well-known use case in this category is uh, search, typically large-scale search, as, such as web search. Um, you need to look at lots of data to make a decision about what to return to the user. Right? Uh, recommendation is a similar use case that has been um, very hot in this space over the last years, where you also need to uh, look at all the data that you could potentially recommend to uh, make a decision. Right? But there are lots of other use cases where it's less obvious that uh, you need to look at lots of data. But if you consider it, it's always better to be able to look at lots of data to make a decision than to not be able to do it. Right? And therefore, in the long run, those who do it will outcompete the ones that don't. Another way to look at this is um, to divide AI into two categories. Intuition AI is very popular these days, and um, that's what you do when you do things like uh, neural nets, things like that. You condense all your data into a very small, or at least a pretty small set of numbers, that is your neural net or whatever, and then you only use that to make a decision, right? Uh, that's similar to what the brain is doing when we are uh, acting on instinct, right? We're just looking, using some uh, glorified lookup table to make decisions that are sort of pre-computed based on experience, right? And that's good because it's cheap and so on. Uh, but there's also room for deliberate reasoning where you actually look at past experience in real time and use that specific past experience to make decisions. Right? This is similar to the type 1 and type 2 distinction of uh, human processing. We have two different systems for this. Right? One system that is intuitive, uh, making decisions, you know, based on lookup tables and one that is using deliberate reasoning based on experience. And as in humans, AI need both. So what are the advantages of making decisions online? They are in a way more obvious. First off, if you make decisions online, uh, you can use all the up-to-date information you have, both about the particular situation, for example, what is the user up to, what's the situation of the user, if there's a user, things like that, but also up-to-date information about the data you have, what has happened to the data lately, what has been added to your data set, things like that. Secondly, you don't waste computation because decisions that are not turned out not to be needed will actually never be computed, right? While if you're computing offline, you need to do everything eagerly in case you will need it in your online system. Right? For the same reason, when you do things online, you can make very fine-grained decisions because you only make the decisions that you really need. Right? To return to our streaming site example, um, if you compute the recommended list of movies offline, you can't really compute a list for every single user because it's just too expensive. So you need to lump your users into big segments and then compute something for each of the segments. While if you're doing it online, you don't need to compute for a given time period for all the users that don't actually show up in that time period. So you can compute a specific list for each particular user as they actually show up. Lastly, it makes for much simpler architectures because if you make decisions offline, you usually find out it's not good enough and then you need to um, compensate those systems with sub-architectures that uh, make take the latest data into account and things like that, and that leads to more complex systems. And you also need um, tighter integration between your offline decision making and then moving lots of data regularly to your uh, online serving systems and so on. If you have a component that can make decisions or big data in real time, architecturally it's very simple, even though it's complex on the inside. The only thing you need to do is to write all your data to that component in real time 
and issue queries to it when you need, need a decision made. So if you have all these advantages, why aren't everybody already doing this? It's because it's hard, really hard. Right? It combines four of the hard things in computer science, which is mutable state, distributed computing, low latency, and high availability. You need all those four to make this work, and that's really hard. Uh, to make real-time actions, you need to find data and make inferences in uh, low milliseconds. To make, to use real-time knowledge, you need to handle updates at a high continuous um, rate, right? To keep your data um, up to speed with what's happening in reality. And to handle both the big data and a large request rate that you typically have online because you're dealing with real things happening in the world, real users and so on. You, you need to be able to scale both to big data and to high request rates. And because you're dealing with, in real time, with things happening in the world, you need high availability. And that means being available even if you lose hardware, uh, with no manual user intervention needed, and also to be able to evolve the system uh, as you go, change schemas, change the logic of the system, change the data models, even the hardware it's running on, while you're serving the queries and handling the writes. And because this is just the applying part of the AI, you also need the learning part, which is offline, so you need integration with uh, the tools you need for learning, which are things like Hadoop, TensorFlow, and so on. So that's much, much too expensive and time consuming to develop for most organizations, even really big ones. Um, but luckily something happened uh, about 15 years ago that made it possible to make this kind of technology. And that is web search because it became really, really lucrative. And that funded the development of this kind of technology. So I'm the architect of a platform called Vespa, which is now open source, so everybody can use it to solve these kind of problems. Uh, it's available on Vespa AI and also on uh, GitHub. Um, as I mentioned, it was funded by uh, web search, specifically the web search we had in uh, Yahoo. We made two technologies at the time to solve these problems. One was Hadoop and the other was Vespa. Vespa actually started a bit before. And the core idea of both was because you're dealing with such large data sets, you want to move the computation to the data rather than moving the data to the computation as you do in a typical two-tier uh, system. Right? Hadoop we were able to open source right away but because of all the complex IP in the search space, we weren't able to open source Vespa until about two years ago. So just briefly about how Vespa is used um, in what's now Verizon Media, which used to be Yahoo, AOL, and so on. Um, it's in that company, we run it on a cloud for about 200 uh, applications, serving over a billion users. In total, we have about 300,000 requests to these applications uh, per second, and about 100 billion content items, something like that. Uh, some of these applications are computing in real time personalized content pages for each of the users. So when a user visits one of these pages, uh, there is no predefined page that they will see. Instead, we have a model of each of the users, and then we evaluate that model over all the content that we have in real time, and then compute a personalized page based on that. And we also use similar methods to compute the in the native ads, the ads in the stream on these pages, and both are done uh, with Vespa. It's also used now since it's open source on a bunch of other big companies you have heard of, but at this point I'm not 
allowed to say any of the big ones, so I, I won't. Um, so some more details about these early use cases of big data serving that I mentioned. The first use case that made all of this possible is uh, large-scale search. Here your data items obviously are text documents and the queries are the keywords that the users type and the models that you want to evaluate, machine learning models, are some kind of relevance model, typically what's called the GBDT model because that fits well to search, gradient boosted decision trees. And you select the items by that relevance model. Right? So Vespa has all the features that you need to do this, full text indices with positional information that allows you to do relevance better, uh, lots of optimizations for GBDT models, which are expensive, but there are some neat tricks you can do to make them run fast. Um, lots of text match relevance features using the, rel uh, the positional information support for text snippeting, linguistics, uh, things like that. There's also a very recent interesting for us development that is happening in the search space, which is what some people call search 2.0, which is moving away from all of that, those things I mentioned, all the specific text stuff or text search uh, completely and instead just convert uh, all the text to uh, vectors or tensors and then use um, vector similarity and neural nets and things like that to uh, solve your search problems. So uh, there's a big shift nowadays, right, in text processing in general uh, towards uh, deep neural lear learning and things like that, especially with popularized with the BERT model that Google announced that they were using for uh, web search recently. Um, these models sort of, they convert t sentences or meaning or words, something like that, to uh, vectors that somehow represent the meaning in a latent space, right? And that's, in my opinion, not a very good way to solve text understanding in general, but for search is very good because the biggest problem in search is that you need the vocabulary of the user to match the vocabulary of the documents, otherwise you won't get a match, right? If they happen to use different words. While the specific thing that these uh, neural models deliver is that they turn all these similar words into very similar vectors, and then if you use vector similarity, you can find them. Right? And to do that, you need a different set of features like native support for vectors and tensors, fast vector similarity, and things like that. And that you can also find in Vespa. And the reason for that is that it's very important for the other common use case or big data serving that is sort of a mainstream now, which is recommendation. Uh, in recommendation, your data items can be anything that can be recommended to somebody. There are applications where it's articles, videos, uh, restaurants, things like that, travel, clans in some well-known uh, games out there is using it from Vespa. Lots of things can be recommended, right? And the queries here are typically some hard filters that tells you what kind of data is eligible in a given case. And then you have some machine learn recommender models, um, something like collaborative filtering, for example, uh, that you want to evaluate or all the um, data items that are not filtered out. And then you select items by the highest score. So for that you'd need, as I mentioned, tensor and vector support and fast vector similarity. Um, but you also need support for more advanced machine learning models, typically models that you train in TensorFlow or Scikit or XGBoost, something like this. And Vespa has support for importing that into its own tensor computational engine 
uh, with no additional work needed on the part of the user. Uh, another thing you really want to have when you do this at large scale, especially over when your data collections approaches hundreds of millions or above that, and that is approximate uh, nearest neighbor search, where you are able to look at much more data with lower costs by sacrificing some uh, accuracy in what you return. Typically, you don't find all the near neighbors, but you find enough that is good enough. Right? And there are some sp speciality engines that can do that for you, but usually they can't be combined with filters, and in almost every application that is crucial. So we are working on a solution that will give you both at the same time uh, really fast. It will be ready sometime early next year, I guess. So those are the two mainstream use cases of big data serving that everybody knows about um, until now. Uh, as I mentioned, my claim is that every application that is applying AI will actually will eventually move over to use big data serving. Uh, and for that, you need to look uh, beyond these two use cases, right? So I'll just mention one more use case for inspiration, uh, which very fast, which is this one. Your data items are assets, and your query is some update to the state of the world. And the model that you evaluate is some price predictor over these assets using that world state. And in this case, you don't select the items with the highest price, but with the highest price change, uh, given this update to the world state. Right? And that's an insight we have seen that uh, enables many more use cases that you understand that you don't need to select the items with the highest score based on your uh, machine learning models. You can select by any other criteria. Right? Anyway, if you implement this on Vespa, you can find the assets that change the most in response to some events. And crucially, you can do it faster than anybody else using completely up-to-date information. And that turns out to be very valuable. I'll skip this one. Um, so on the four maturity levels, I mentioned um, analytics as the second stage uh, of maturity, right? And big data serving is the fourth. Uh, but if you squint a little bit, the technologies are similar, right? Because you select something over your data, and then you compute something over all the data that you selected, and then you uh, organize it somehow, and you return a result, right? Uh, but in terms of the optimizations that you want to do and so on, they, these technologies become quite uh, dissimilar. If you do analytics, you have people that you pay to run your queries for you, and they are typically much more patient, so your response times can be in seconds. Uh, for the same reason, there's a low query rate, while if you do things online, you will need really low latency, and you will typically have a very high uh, query rate. Um, in analytics, you almost always look at time series data, uh, while we assume that all the data is uh, uh, random write random writable, so you can update any data at any time. Um, and if you do analytics, because it's your employees using the system, downtime and data loss are typically uh, acceptable, while in Vespa those things can never ever happen. Um, so all these things are better in Vespa, but the cost is that if your data sets are really massive, like trillions of documents, then it will be really expensive to uh, use Vespa, while you can still do it kind of cheaply uh, for analytics purposes. So then we have talked about what big data serving really is and introduced Vespa as an engine that uh, can solve this problem for you. Um, 
what's remaining of this talk is to look a bit more into how big the big data serving challenges that I mentioned are actually solved by Vespa. So to re uh, recap those challenges, what you need to do big data serving is to do search and selection over both structured and unstructured, that is text data uh, with low latency, um, and also do scoring, relevance, inference um, over all the data that you select using both natural language features, if you have that, and more advanced machine learning models. Uh, you also typically want to organize the data somehow and aggregate values over the data. This ranges from things like uh, mm, introducing diversity into what you recommend to things like producing navigational views on a shopping site, things like that. Um, you want your data to be up to date with what's really happening in the world, which translates to handling real-time writes at a high sustained rate. And for the same reason, you want your clusters to be uh, auto-recovering. So if you lose data, you want them to automatically rebalance the data. i uh, sorry, if you lose a node, you will want the data to be um, distributed or the remaining nodes. And if you add or remove hardware or switch it out completely, you want the data to be um, rebalanced over the currently available hardware. Typically in these applications, you also have some business logic. So you need a built-in processing logic container to handle uh, adding data to all the data that is written, which is computed, and uh, decorating the queries, uh, processing the results, things like that. And because these systems need to scale, they typically consist of lots and lots of nodes and even more processes. And setting up and, man and uh, managing that manually is too hard. So you need managed clusters where the system sets up and manages all of this for you. So with that, we can take a very high level look at the architecture that Vespa uses to uh, solve these problems. So it's a two-tier system. You have a stateless Java container uh, at the top that handles all the incoming writes and queries and so on, where uh, applications can also plug in their own logic to do additional processing. Then we have what we call co content clusters that stores the data and handling all the redistribution of the data and so on. And also, crucially, is executing the distributed part of the queries. Right? So as I mentioned, we don't, as in a traditional two-tier system, we don't send the data up to the stateless tier for processing. Instead, we create a representation of the computation that you want to make and send it down to the content clusters. And because these systems can be large, they are hard to manage manually. So we have a third cluster, which is the administration cluster that um, that manages these clusters for you. So what the user is seeing is what we call an application package, which is a manifest, a description at a high level of the system that you want to run and what capabilities it should have and so on. And this is deployed to the administration subsystem, which will then set up the system for you. And if you make a change, want to make a change to your application, you just change the application package and deploy it again. And the system will, if the change is safe, uh, make the change happen in the background while it's still serving and handling queries. And handling writes, I mean. So the if there's only one purpose for this system, it is to be able to compute really fast or early data, right? So how can you do that? There's three main strategies. One is parallelization. Uh, the queries that come in are sent in parallel to all the content nodes that uh, has some of the content that is relevant for that given query. 
who is parallelized over nodes. And on each of the nodes is parallelized again over uh, a set of cores that dynamically split the workload between them. The second strategy you can use is to prepare data structures at write time uh, to make uh, query time processing faster, right? And the sort of canonical uh, example here is reverse text indices in text search, right? But databases are doing something similar with uh, B3 indices and so on, right? And Vespa has both of those and some other techniques as well in this space. The third technique you can use and actually have to use at large scale is to move the execution to the uh, data nodes. And this goes for both the queries and the machine learned models. So in this case, you see there's some machine learned model as part of the application package. When then you deploy that machine learned model is copied to all of the content nodes such that they can evaluate the machine learned models over the content um, locally. And just to drive that uh, point home, here is from a, a bench benchmark we did com uh, comparing um, TensorFlow serving uh, to Vespa and specifically comparing uh, scaling. In this case, we uh, had, uh, had the data on a set of nodes and then we tried to either evaluate using uh, the Vespa representation of the TensorFlow model running locally on each of these content partitions, or shipping the data to the stateless tier and evaluating their uh, user TensorFlow serving. Right. And you can see here that if you used the TensorFlow serving method, then it doesn't help you anything to add additional nodes because your bottleneck isn't really the nodes, it's the bandwidth in your data center because if you do the math, you'd see that you very quickly run out of bandwidth if you want to send all this data for evaluation to a stateless tier. While in Vespa, you get almost linear scaling with adding partitions because the, all of them work in parallel using local data, so you never run out of bandwidth. So some more technical details about how queries are evaluated on content nodes uh, in Vespa. We do what's called document at the time evaluation over all the query operators. Um, we use both post-decisional indices for uh, text search, the traditional kind, but we also use B-trees in memory, both for structured data and also for the recent changes to the posting list. And that is the sort of key ingredient that allows us to do uh, cheap and fast real-time indexing uh, over textual data. Uh, the structured data is what we call attribute fields. They are stored as in-memory forward data um, because you want to do random uh, lookups to them while you're doing your uh, machine learn model evaluation and so on. Uh, but optionally, you can also have B-trees uh, over those so that you can use them as strong filters in your queries. Um, similar to database, you also have a transaction log so that we can uh, acknowledge writes and store them even though they are not yet stored anywhere else than in a transaction log. And then we have a separate store of the raw data using something similar to level DB, if you know it, which is a log store, um, which we use for serving the raw data and for recovery and redistribution, where we need to take the raw data, parts of it, and send it to another node uh, that needs to replicate that data. Right. Vespa automatically uh, distributes the data over a set of nodes and over, um, yeah, over a set of nodes with a set replication factor. So you need to trade off how many copies you want of each piece of data with your probability of uh, losing data, right? If you lose, if you have two copies and you lose three nodes at exactly the same time, then you will still uh, lose data, right? Um, you can also optionally create multiple groups of nodes that have 
uh, copies of all their, your data so that you can then automatically with Vesper route the queries to one of these groups so that you can scale to higher um, query loads that you could if you scatter all your queries to the same nodes. Right. Whenever you make a change in your application package to how you want to distribute your data, you just redeploy and Vesper will affect the change in the background. You never manually partition data you never worry about how it's partitioned uh, and so on. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of technology, it's based on an algorithm called Crush, which allows us to do um, balanced distribution of data without having a dictionary uh, of where each piece of data is. Um, I've been mentioning another central part of Vespo which is the inference engine, which uses uh, tensor math to represent machine learned models. Um, so we have a model of tensors that allows you to create both dense and sparse uh, tensors and dimensions that are dense and sparse uh, combined together. So you can, for example, have a uh, like a map of vectors, which is often useful. Um, and then you can write mathematical uh, expressions using tensor math over these things, and that allows you to express all the machine learn models that we know about. Uh, so you can write these mathematical expressions manually, but many people prefer to just save the output of their machine learning algorithms directly to Vespa, so we have created converters from uh, tools like TensorFlow and all the other tools that are using O1NX. And also XGBoost, which is mainly used for uh, GBDT. Um, compared to something like TensorFlow Serving, Vespa is optimized for uh, the big data serving use case, which means you want to be able to evaluate the same model over many data items really fast. and that leads to different optimizations than you would use uh, in a more batch-oriented system. And yeah, I forgot to mention the whole content layer is written in C++, which is a more suited language for uh, this kind of low-level um, um, data handling. So just to give an intuition, this is a simple model in uh, TensorFlow on the left, they use a graph model of uh, tensor computation, right? while on the right is the equivalent uh, mathematical expression in Vespa's language. So this uses the basis operators in Vespa, but we also have, uh, as you can see in the middle column there, we have lots and lots of high-level functions which are the same you would find in um, in the learning tools for dealing with tensors. I should mention this uh, briefly as well. Um, we do development of Vespa in the open on GitHub. And you can follow it uh, on that URL. Um, and we do production releases about four times a week. And the most sophisticated users we have outside my company is actually automatically picking up and deploying those releases every time they happen. When we release, we have already passed large test suites, but we have also already upgraded all the applications I mentioned that we run ourselves in our cloud and run them for some time. So those releases are really well uh, verified already. So we have reached the end of uh, this talk. Um, if you want to make good use of uh, big data for AI, it means making decisions uh, online. And that is increasingly true because those who don't will have inferior solutions and will be outcompeted. Uh, Vespa is the only platform available that is focusing on solving this problem. Uh, they're really the very biggest players, like Google, have technologies that can do this kind of thing, of course. 
For example, they, I know they have their own TensorFlow execution engine with the same kind of optimizations that we do. But none of that technology is uh, open source and it's not a unified platform. So we're not aware of anybody else that are doing this in the open source space. Um, if you want to try it out, the simplest way is to use our cloud. We have a development cluster where people can deploy uh, for free. It's well available on cloudvespa.ai. We also have tutorials available, especially this blog search and recommendation tutorial that starts with downloading blog data, training, uh, machine learning models and so on, and then deploying everything to Vespa. So it takes you from nothing to have accomplished uh, typical uh, data science, applied data science uh, task. So that's pretty nice. Okay, that's the end of the talk. Any questions?